the Mojave Desert, a vast foreboding expanse of sand, sun, and wind. A harsh and rugged landscape broken by jagged ranges and steep ridges, revered by its original native inhabitants, but a daunting environment to those unaccustomed to its extremes. And yet, this is where one million young Americans came to train for battle during World War II, where our soldiers built the skills and resilience needed to win in combat. In this gritty endeavor, millions of acres, designated as the Desert Training Center, became both foe and friend. I think the word isolated is putting it mildly. Just 50 miles east of Palm Springs lies the western boundary of the Desert Training Center. The largest military reservation in U.S. history, it encompassed 18,000 square miles spread across Arizona, Nevada, and California. There are still remains from that time, road grids and crumbling foundations are mute testimony to the enormity of what took place. At its height, there were a dozen divisional camps, each holding some 15,000 men, along with numerous landing strips and five major airfields to support them. One of these was Rice Army Airfield, where young men learned to fight in the sky. In our war, we knew what the stakes were. And we just had to stay with it and do it, and we did. By the fall of 1941, the world had already been at war for two years. Avoiding direct involvement, the United States had confined itself to supplying materials for the beleaguered allies. That changed on December 7th, when Japanese aircraft destroyed much of the Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Overnight, this nation was united in an all-out determination to avenge the hideous assault on American lives and property. Now practically the entire world is joined in a horrible war. With war declared, the United States found itself unprepared to fight the Axis powers. The entire army consisted of less than 200,000 troops with only one battle-ready division. In Europe, the Germans had swept British and Allied forces off the continent, driving them back to defend Egypt and the critical Suez Canal in North Africa. There, they faced one of Germany's most effective generals, Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox. At British Prime Minister Churchill's urging, President Roosevelt agreed to make this far corner of the world America's first battleground in World War II. Everybody knew it was going to the desert, going to fight Rommel. That was all the concentration was from, you're going to fight Rommel. Uh, one of the great advantages of North Africa for uh, the Americans in particular was that it was a, a good place to learn to fight. It was a place that the Germans were relatively weak, especially in terms of air power. The Army turned to General George S. Patton, Jr. to find an appropriate locale to train the troops for the rigors of desert warfare. Patton and his staff explored the Mojave in March of 1942 and found it an ideal location, exclaiming, we cannot train troops to fight in the desert of North Africa by training in the swamps of Georgia. 
Well, Patton was looking for a place where his troops could train in isolation and secrecy, and this certainly gave him that. And the Army really wanted a place where they could practice maneuvers with large numbers of troops, with large units operating together over a wide area. America goes to war to save the homes and ideals of free men from Axis domination. Patton's vision was well served by the thousands of young men entering the armed services, many of whom had already built bridges, dams, and roads as part of the Depression-era WPA programs. There was a sort of optimism uh, about the American soldier. We refer to it as the greatest generation, but it was, a, it was a generation that was actually made by the New Deal, who believed that government could do good things. Because we had the Depression and a CCC camp, and a C and a, and the CCC camp taught us to fight for something that, that nobody else can touch. We fought a war, and we fought for a country that we had worked for. We had built. They came with a can-do spirit to create the roads, structures, and utilities necessary for a massive training center, all within a few short months. The camps had a plan. The areas were completely bulldozed. They were cleared. Uh, boulevards were laid out. Streets were laid out. And it, it wasn't random. The company streets were set up with uh, two rows of tents with an assembly area in between. So there was a very regimented army uh, fashion of setting up the camps. The architects of the Desert Training Center chose location strategically to cope with the immense logistical demands of transporting thousands of arriving soldiers and then supplying them. Well, Rice Army Air Base is just a couple of miles down the road. One of the main reasons it was built where it was was because of these railroad tracks that were here before the base was built. Off to my right is the Metropolitan Water District's Colorado River Aqueduct, which provided all the water that those many men needed at Rice Army Air Base. I met some officers who really didn't know where they were when uh, they uh, got to Rice. They knew where they came from, but they didn't know where they landed. Most new soldiers came from east of the Mississippi and were unprepared for the sight that awaited them after their long train ride west. They were told maybe that they were going to California and they were thinking of Hollywood and the beaches and they were really excited about their new duty station. And uh, the vast majority of them rode the train. They're told to get off the train and here they are in this vast wasteland. You should have heard some of these guys cuss in California. But you can't blame them not seeing any place else in the state and then dropping them off here in no man's land. Sergeant Horace Barrett, 709th Tank Battalion. The dramatically different surroundings weren't the least of the surprises awaiting the new recruits. These large training areas were, of course, a, a shock. I mean, these are people from places that, for California, sounds uh, incredibly exotic. I mean, you're mixing Protestants and Catholics. Suffering together in the heat, a tent camp in the middle of nowhere, far from any comforts of home or civilization in a, a desolate desert, really uh, tended to bring the men together and uh, really uh, strengthen those bonds of unit cohesion, which are critical to winning overseas. We started pitching tents, five men per tent, and on the first day we were pitching them, I felt something warm bite me on the side. Then a scorpion ran out of my pant leg and one of the guys killed it. They took me over and lanced it and sucked out the poison. Then they gave me a furlough. Corporal O.V. Kaufman, 736 Tank Battalion. For trainees, these camps in the middle of nowhere were home for the next several months. Soldiers did what they could to make the best of the situation. The men really took pride in their specific areas. And there's lots of instances where unit symbols were spelled out in rocks um, with painstaking detail to find just the right color to get the unit symbol just right. 
and uh, lots of uh, stories of men sweeping their company area. Here they were out in the middle of the desert, but there's brooms out sweeping the company streets and the Reveille areas, and you can see a lot of pride in those units and, and in the unit areas. The decision to have the rock alignments and the divisional emblems and things like this, this may be more a product of the individual troops uh, showing pride or making the landscape when they were out here for their period of training. This one is known as the Iron Mountain Divisional Camp or Camp Iron Mountain. It's typical of the other camps, but it is distinguished by the fact that it has uh, two religious altars, uh, one on the eastern side of the camp and one on the western side of the camp. I mean, we have to remember that Patton's number one goal was to prepare troops for the rigors of desert warfare. And in these situations, I'm sure spirituality would have been a very important component of the training. The troops did get some time off for um, rest and relaxation, and a lot of times they spent playing cards, writing letters home. It's hot and dusty, and you just make do with what's available. Off duty, you can't do much. There are craft games and card games, and they have a PX that serves warm beer when they can get it. Lieutenant Gil Terry, 736th Tank Battalion. Periodically, the USO would break the soldiers' routine and loneliness with a Saturday night dance in the desert, bussing in young ladies from Los Angeles. Organized by Mrs. Edward G. Robinson, they called themselves the Desert Battalion. Their time with the troops was welcomed, if all too brief. Perhaps the most uh, favorite among the troops were when the celebrities came out from Los Angeles, which was only you know, a couple hour drive out into the desert. So they had some pretty big name uh, entertainers that came out. There was Bob Hope and Dinah Shore and Red Skelton and, and a variety of others that came out and, and entertained the troops uh, right there in their camps. The mind air might of the United Nations is loosed upon war plants in Nazi occupied Europe. As the war raged in Europe and the Pacific, military strategists increasingly relied on air power to take the fight to the enemy. New planes poured out of America's factories. Pilots were needed to fly the fighters and bombers. Air bases like Rice Army Airfield were critical in preparing pilots and air crews. So there's still two runways that are visible today. There's uh, taxiways that you can still see in the desert surface. There's a large concrete apron behind us, which you can see. There's a lot of foundations for the buildings. There are extensive rock-lined walkways that show where troops lived and, and worked for two years. Well, believe it or not, this is the remains of what was once an active runway here at Rice Army Airfield. It was originally built with a mixture of sand, and asphalt to create a relatively durable surface? Well, the runway wasn't as smooth as it might have been, but it was substantial. It supported the airplane all right. The A-20 Havoc attack bomber and the durable P-39 Era Cobra fighter were familiar aircraft at Rice Army Airfield. Young men flew them for target practice precision bombing, and strafing runs. Clear weather nearly all year long let pilots spend countless hours aloft. The work was exciting, but it was also dangerous. With new pilots pushing their limits, crashes were inevitable. Most of the pilots that were out here were young, probably averaging between the ages of 18 and 20. They'd had some flight experience before arriving here in the Desert Training Center, but with the good weather that the desert provided, this is where they really gain the lion's share of their training and flight experience before going overseas. I was always impressed at how quick a 20-year-old could become a man. He, he went over there, you know, thinking, I'm going to be Rickenbacker. I'm going to be an ace. It wasn't long till he realized that wasn't very easy, and there was a job to be done. He began to realize that he's fighting for the freedom of his mother and father and family back home.
The Desert Training Center was first and foremost a simulated theater of war, where realistic combat operations tested men and equipment prior to deployment overseas. Training encompassed new tactics and measures adapted for the desert, such as camouflage, dispersed formations, and coordination of forces. They wanted to be able to work infantry with armor, with artillery, with air support, all together in one place. And this desert was perfect for that type of combined training. Maneuvers could involve as many as 30,000 troops, coordinating with hundreds of tanks and numerous planes over a broad landscape. Patton believed in training uh, troops under the conditions that they were going to experience in, in the actual battlefield. Exposure to the heat, the harshness of the surroundings, to the, uh, the real life sounds and feels of what the battlefield experience was going to be like. What did I know about deserts? I was from Massachusetts. So damn hot you could fry an egg on the palm of your hand. One day, a corporal calls me in and says, some dumb damn fool general thinks we're going to win the war with tanks. I think his name is Patton. Would you go with him? I said, I'll go any place. Lieutenant John Coveney, 736 Tank Battalion. The, the whole character of the center really was imbued with his vision of training and preparing for war. He really wanted to create a desire among his troops to, to close with the enemy and destroy them. And, and the Desert Training Center really took on that persona, I think. It was in the Palin Pass area that uh, commanders could bring all of the elements of the battlefield exercise into one location. Airplanes, bombers uh, would, would come from Rice Airfield and do strafing runs through the area. You would have troop movements moving through the area. And it, it allowed uh, troops to experience both how to attack these kinds of positions as well as defend these kinds of positions. All the other factors are secondary to tactics. How did you do the job? How you did it. You didn't stand up. You crawl on your belly. Troops would have been uh, participating at the same time live fire exercises were going on. Tanks were using real munitions. Uh, the troops were using real munitions. Uh, the airplanes were using real munitions in and, and, and many of these exercises. On the way into camp, we passed the remains of blown up vehicles. As the men passed by, they wonder just how realistic the training they were getting into was going to be, whether this burned out tank was just the beginning. Lieutenant Bill Sweeney, 736th Tank Battalion. This truly was a battlefield area, and the remnants of that battlefield are still present. You can see the, uh, the, uh, the, the gun emplacements where the howitzers would have been put down into the ground to give them support for the recoil. Uh, you have the uh, foxholes that, uh, that are uh, sort of dot the landscape. They gave you two hours to dig a foxhole, and you and then, a t and then they brought the tanks in to run right over. That's a hell of an experience, because you don't know when you're going to get dig deep enough, but you dug. When you got to half an hour before that tank got there, you really dug. Because it kept telling you every 10 minutes, that tank's going to be here, that tank's going to be here. You see that big tank over there, and he's going to run right over you. Monday night, we left her on a 200-mile road march with the new tanks. We didn't have any sleep from Sunday night to Wednesday night. We were on the road with the tanks all of that time. It was hell. Sergeant Horace Barrett, 709th Tank Battalion. It means walking eight miles to a 24 mile marches, 100 mile marches. You had the discipline of water. That's all the water you got between eight in the morning and, and, and 11 at night when you stop. That mile of water. <laughs> That's all the water. I mean, that meant to bathe and everything. One of Patton's most well-known quotes was that the, uh, the California desert could kill quicker than the enemy, and uh, we'll lose a lot of men to heat, but it'll save hundreds of lives when we get into combat. You know, you've got to sort of lay the groundwork in places like this for an army that's, that's going to function. It's not just learning the mechanics. It's learning how to be a soldier, how to think like a soldier, but while still retaining those sort of civilian characteristics, that are going to make, I think, the American forces extremely successful in World War II. Somewhere in the California desert, American armored troops are training. One sees a small cloud on the fringe of the desert. It sweeps by and beyond, crunching everything in its path. 
It is this force that will someday leave death in its wake in the sandy places of Libya or wherever it may be sent. Yank Magazine, December 23rd, 1942. After just a few months in command, Patton left the Desert Training Center to plan Operation Torch, the Anglo-American invasion of North Africa. Patton's vision of rigorous, realistic training proved its worth throughout the war, beginning with success in North Africa. Soldiers who trained at the Desert Training Center were later involved in combat throughout Europe and the Pacific. I think the Desert Training Center was really uh, critical in the war effort. The troops who trained there ended up doing pretty well overseas. You look at the divisions that trained there and, and the 339th Fighter Bomber Group who trained at Rice Army Air Base were um, some of the most highly decorated in the war. So the benefit of our training at Rice was that we had stability. Our pilots and enlisted people worked together and as a team and being able to do this for six months gave us a lot of uh, bonding. Ultimately, John Henry's 339th Fighter Group was sent to England in support of the bombing campaign in Europe. Then we got orders to go to England. And uh, that was a great reward. At Rice Airfield, the P-39 era Cobra worked well enough for training, but in a dogfight, it was no match against a German Messerschmitt. However, in England, the 339th was given a new aircraft, the prized P-51 Mustang, which became a dominant World War II fighter. And when we knew we were going to get 51s, uh, we were very gleeful. It was an airplane that was easy to fly, it is a joy to fly. Heading east, they rendezvous at the appointed time and place with the heavy bombers. And here are the heavies, giant flying fortresses that drop their tons of high explosives on pinpoint targets. We are uh, protecting the bombers just doing the duty we were called on to do every day. That was getting the airplane, go escort those bombers. They flew mission by every third or fourth day. And uh, they, their chances of coming back weren't very good. Sometimes, you know, you, you think back of what those men did in the group. The, dedication that they had and what they had to do and what might be the consequence, it, it, it sort of caused you to well up a little bit. Almost every day you, you cried a little bit because you lost two or three maybe that day. It was always a happy day when everybody came back. The victory flash electrified Times Square, keyed to the bursting point as the magic word of complete surrender came through. Though it required tremendous sacrifice, the Allied forces would eventually triumph in Europe and the Pacific. In April of 1944, just two years after its inception, the Desert Training Center was decommissioned, having served its purpose well. Its remnants are slowly being reclaimed by the desert. And yet, Patton's legacy survives in the methods and rigors of desert training, still valued by today's military. General Patton would be proud. The, the greatest thing about the Desert Training Center was the vision that not only did it share for preparing for combat then, but, but preparing for combat today. So the vision that was there in the Desert Training Center back in 1942 is still shared here today and prepares us for combat uh, as we send units off wherever the country may need them. So when a soldier comes here who is not necessarily conditioned to this environment, they understand that it's this environment that will prepare them for combat. 
It is this environment that will prepare the leadership, and it's this environment that will test not only them, but their equipment to go downrange and face the realities of combat. Well, training serves several purposes. Obviously, you're taking civilians, you're teaching them the sort of rudiments of how to be a soldier. Uh, you're teaching them to live together, but you're also sort of forging uh, a spirit. You're forging um, a notion of why, why we're doing this. That's, that's the answer to why we won the war. We had a spirit. We did it because we worked together. When the time to fight for our country, we whipped everybody. I think men who felt a strong duty to the defense of their country, to the preservation of our way of life, I think that's the legacy that we'd like to leave. The men the guns, the mock battles are gone now. Faded tank tracks and airstrips, ghostly grids of tent cities, these bear witness to the momentous effort and sacrifice that began with Patton's vision here in a desolate corner of America and ended in victory in the heartland of Germany and the coral atolls in the Pacific. A story of trial and triumph entombed in the former Desert Training Center and Rice Army Airfield in the sands of the Mojave, Freedom's Desert. The sun's gone down, got a minute to write A letter to your mama here by candlelight No sheets on my cot in this tent we're in Somebody said today it was 110 No refrigerator, no electricity At Desert Training Center, that's the way it has to be Center boogie's not a dance you see A mile run in the sun when it's 103 Full pack and a rifle, here we go again Get it out this minute, get it in and under 10 Training center boogie's not a dance you see A mile run in the sun when it's 103 Full pack and a rifle, here we go again Get it out this minute, get it in and under 10. The Mojave Desert, a vast, foreboding expanse of sand, sun, and wind. revered by its original native inhabitants, but a daunting environment to those unaccustomed to its extremes. This is where one million young Americans came to train for battle during World War II. In this gritty endeavor, millions of acres of the Mojave Desert, designated as the Desert Training Center, became both foe and friend. I think the word isolated is putting it mildly. Just 50 miles east of Palm Springs lies the western boundary of the Desert Training Center. The largest military reservation in U.S. history, it encompassed 18,000 square miles of desolate terrain spread across Arizona, Nevada, and California. There are still remains from that time, some only visible from the air. At its height, a dozen divisional camps were churning with activity each accommodating some 15,000 men, along with five airfields to support them. One of these was Rice Army Airfield, where young men learned to fight 
in the sky. By the fall of 1941, much of the world had already been at war for two years, when Japanese aircraft bombed the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. In Europe, the Germans had swept British and Allied forces off the continent, driving them back to defend Egypt and the critical Suez Canal in North Africa. At British Prime Minister Churchill's urging, President Roosevelt agreed to make this far corner of the world America's first battleground in World War II. The Army turned to General George S. Patton, Jr. to find an appropriate locale to train for the rigors of desert warfare. Patton and his staff explored the Mojave Desert in March 1942. Patton was looking for a place where his troops could train in isolation, in secrecy, and this certainly gave them that. And the Army really wanted a place where they could practice maneuvers with large numbers of troops, with large units, operating together over a wide area. They came with a can-do spirit to create the roads, structures, and utilities necessary for a massive training center, all within a few short months. The camps had a plan. The areas were completely bulldozed. They were cleared. Uh, boulevards were laid out, streets were laid out, and it, it wasn't random. The architects of the Desert Training Center chose locations strategically to cope with the immense logistical demands of transporting thousands of arriving soldiers and then supplying them. Well, Rice Army Air Base is just a couple of miles down the road. One of the main reasons it was built where it was was because of these railroad tracks that were here before the base was built. Off to my right is the Metropolitan Water District's Colorado River Aqueduct, which provided all the water that those many men needed at Rice Army Air Base. Most new soldiers came from east of the Mississippi and were unprepared for the sight that awaited them after their long train ride west. The vast majority of them rode the train. They're told to get off the train, and here they are in this vast wasteland. These large training areas were, of course, a, a shock. I mean, these are people from places that, for California, sounds incredibly exotic. I mean, you're mixing Protestants and Catholics. For trainees, these camps in the middle of nowhere were home for the next several months. The men really took pride in their specific areas, and there's lots of instances where Unit symbols were spelled out in rocks um, with painstaking detail to find just the right color to get the unit symbol just right. And uh, lots of, of stories of men sweeping their company area. Here they were out in the middle of the desert, but there's brooms out sweeping the company streets and the Reveille areas. And you can see a lot of pride in those units and in the unit areas. The Desert Training Center was first and foremost a simulated theater of war emphasizing realistic combat operations. Training included tactics and measures adapted for the desert, like camouflage, dispersed formations, and coordination of forces. Patton believed in training uh, troops under the conditions that they were going to experience in, in the actual battlefield. Exposure to the heat, the harshness of the surroundings, to the, uh, the real life sounds and feels of what the battlefield experience was going to be like. The, the whole character of the center really was imbued with his vision of training and preparing for war. He really wanted to create a desire among his troops to, to close with the enemy and destroy them. It was in the Palin Pass area that uh, commanders could bring all of the elements of the battlefield exercise into one location. Airplanes, bombers uh, would, would come from Rice Airfield and do strafing runs through the area. You would have troop movements moving through the area and it allowed uh, troops to experience both how to attack these kinds of positions as well as defend these kinds of positions. All the other factors are secondary to tactics. How did you do the job? How you did it? You didn't stand up, you crawl on your belly. Troops would have been uh, participating at the same time live fire exercises were going on. Tanks were using real munitions, uh, the troops were using real munitions. Uh, the airplanes were using real munitions in, in, in many of these exercises. 
they gave you two hours to dig a foxhole, and you and then it, and then they brought the tanks in to run right over. That's a hell of an experience. But you don't know when you're gonna get dig deep enough. But you dug when you got to half an hour before that tank got there. You really dug, because it kept telling you every ten minutes that tank's gonna be here. That tank's gonna be here. You see that big tank over there, and you're gonna run right over you. And one of Patton's most well-known quotes was that the uh, the California desert could kill quicker than the enemy. And uh, we'll lose a lot of men to heat, but it'll save hundreds of lives when we get into combat. It means walking eight miles to 24 mile marches, 100 mile marches. You had the discipline of water. That's all the water you got between eight in the morning and, and, and 11 at night when you stop. That amount of water. <laughs> That's all the water. I mean, that meant to bathe and everything. Soldiers who trained at the Desert Training Center later engaged in battles all over Europe and the Pacific. I think the Desert Training Center was really uh, critical in the war effort. The troops who trained there ended up doing pretty well overseas. You look at the divisions that trained there and, and the 339th Fighter Bomber Group who trained at Rice Army Air Base were um, some of the most highly decorated in the war. So the benefit of our training at Rice was that we had stability. Our pilot enlisted people worked together and as a team and being able to do this for six months gave us a lot of uh, bonding. For the 339th Fighter Bomber Group, their time at Rice Army Airfield resulted in eventual deployment to England to fight in the campaign in Europe that we got orders to go to England. And uh, that was a great reward. At Rice Airfield, the P-39 era Cobra worked well enough for training, but in a dogfight, it was no match against a German Messerschmitt. However, in England, the 339th was given a new aircraft, the prized P-51 Mustang, which became a dominant World War II fighter. And when we knew we were going to get 51s, uh, we were very gleeful. It was an airplane that was easy to fly, and it was a joy to fly it. We uh, checked in the bombers, just doing the duty that we were called on to do every day. That was getting that airplane, go escort those bombers. They flew mission by every third or fourth day. And uh, they, their chances of coming back weren't very good. Sometimes, you know, you, you think back of what those men did in the group, the dedication that they had and what they had to do and what might be the consequence. It, it, it sort of caused you to well up a little bit. Uh, Almost every day you, you cried a little bit because you lost two or three maybe that day. It uh, was always a happy day when everybody came back. The victory flash electrified Times Square, keyed to the bursting point as the magic word of complete surrender came through. Though it required tremendous sacrifice, the Allied forces would eventually triumph in Europe and the Pacific. In April of 1944, just two years after its inception, the Desert Training Center was decommissioned, having served its purpose well. Its remnants are slowly being reclaimed by the desert. Well, training serves several purposes. Obviously, you're taking civilians, you're teaching them the sort of rudiments of how to be a soldier. Uh, you're teaching them to live together, but you're also sort of forging uh, a spirit. You're forging um, a notion of why, why we're doing this. That's, that's the answer to why we won the war. We had a spirit. We did it because we worked together. When the time to fight for our country, we whipped everybody. I think 
men who felt a strong duty to the defense of their country, to the preservation of our way of life. I think that's the legacy that we'd like to leave. The men, the guns, the encampments are gone now. Faded tank tracks and airstrips bear witness to the momentous effort and sacrifice that began here in a desolate corner of America and ended in victory in the heartland of Germany and the atolls in the Pacific. A story of trial and triumph entombed in the former Desert Training Center and Rice Army Airfield in the sands of the Mojave. Freedom's Desert. The sun's gone down, got a minute to write. A letter to your mama here by candlelight. No sheets on my cot in this tent we're in. Somebody said today it was 110. No refrigerator, no electricity. At Desert Training Center, that's the way it has to be. Training Center boogie's not a dance you see. A mile run in the sun when it's 103. Full pack and a rifle, here we go again. Get it out this minute, get it in and under 10. Training center boogie's not a dance you see. A mile run in the sun when it's 103. Full pack and a rifle, here we go again. Get it out this minute, get it in and under 10. <laughs> 